So this might be one of the most vulnerable videos I've ever made. I'm about to give you a little bit of insight into how exactly the sausage gets made here. What exactly is my process of making a video from start to finish? Let's roll. So this video is gonna be aimed mostly at both showing you guys sort of what my creative process is, but also as maybe a bit of a guide of how you can make your own videos. But without further ado, let's get started. So the first place that any video begins is an idea. You need to have something that you want to talk about. So for me, it's some game or some topic about a game that usually sparks my interest. In this particular case, a lot of the footage I'm gonna be showing you was from my Crisis Core video. So it was a review about a game that had recently come out. And if you're someone who has a lot of ideas, you're probably gonna wanna have some means to track those down. The way I do it, is through using a service called Trello. Trello is normally used for more business-oriented applications, but it works surprisingly well for online content creation. I can put all of my ideas for a video in one column and then sort of slide them across as I've gone through the various parts of the process, from having the idea to having it fully uploaded. But once you have that idea though, you don't just wanna go for it. You want to refine down exactly what you want to talk about. And this is usually where the scripting and research section comes in. I'm gonna combine them because as much as I was taught in school that you should do research first, then write, that's never how I did it. I'm that kid who took his first draft for a paper, crossed out first, and wrote final and handed it in. So the way I've done scripting has varied throughout the lifespan of the channel. So when I first was starting out, most of my scripts were fairly well constructed. It was basically me writing an essay and then reading it out on camera or behind the microphone because my early videos were just voiceover. And while that works for having a very coherent and well-structured video, it can have its issues. The first of which is that if you're not careful, people can tell that you're reading, especially due to the fact that most people write differently than how they talk. There's a quote that always sticks with me. I think it's from Harrison Ford from the original Star Wars. I said to George, you can type this stuff, stuff <laughs> but you can't say it. Move your mouth while you're talking, while you're typing it. And I couldn't say it. It took me like 15 takes uh, uh, to say it. Yeah, so I have started to move away from that. Also in part due to the fact that it takes a lot of time to write out every word that you're going to say. So I've tried to move into a bit of a more bulleted format, which is how pretty much all my videos produced in 2022 were made. And even that I felt was a little too, how do I put this, uh, rigid. I was bulleting and writing just my major points, but I was basically just writing an essay without all of the connecting words and punctuation. And so the current process that I'm using is I have jotted a few notes down on my phone and I will refer to them in the case that I need them. But overall, I'm going to try to stay away from using those notes super excessively. Like for the Crisis Core video, I looked at my notes maybe once or twice. The thing to note is that when you're making content, you are the expert. That is how you're presenting yourself. So part of the process is learning the information enough or having just a general idea of what you're going to say and just doing it. Like if you're making a review, there's not a whole lot of information that doesn't already come out of your head. So it's easier for you to just sort of give your opinions and to just have a few bullet points and headers to structure what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. That being said though, the way I plan to still use my notes is mostly just for dates, statistics, or anything that I know would need a source and I need the name of the author slash study or whatever other work it's called on hand, just so I can easily reference them. Also, any direct quotes, obviously, like if I'm gonna read off a direct quote, I need to actually like have the word for word version of that quote. But no matter how you go about scripting your video, eventually that has to make its way from just words on a page to something that can be watched. 
And that is where the recording process comes in. So again, I've gone through various processes. I've swapped back and forth between videos that were purely done in voiceover and videos that were done on camera with B-roll added on top. And I've sort of come to learn the mechanics of both of those methods. And before I start with this section in full, I want you to take note of something. I'm about to talk about and show you a lot of a gear that is very expensive. You do not need any of that if you are starting out. At minimum, the only thing I think you might want to get is a microphone of some type. And even the one I'm using in this video, this is about a $100 microphone. You could probably go cheaper and get like a $50 microphone and that would be sufficient. You just want better than the onboard mic of your camera. And speaking of camera, if you're gonna use a camera, um, you don't have to go out and buy like a $1,000, $2,000 DSLR. I'm using one for this video, but we all have cell phones, and these things have pretty good cameras. Like, this is an iPhone 13. The onboard camera on this thing is pretty good and can shoot in 4K and also has good wide aperture lenses for shooting in low light. That all being said, though, be sure to prioritize your audio above all else, because a video that doesn't look as good, you can live with. But if it doesn't sound good, you're gonna get people to click off. So you want your video to be sounding as good as you can get it within your budget. With that out of the way though, uh, let's look at some fancy toys. So my footage comes in basically two flavors. There is obviously the audio slash visual footage that is the main body of the video, and there is the gameplay B-roll that lays on top of it. Now, granted, you don't necessarily have to record your own footage if you're making gaming videos. There's lots of Let's Plays out there that don't have face cams that you can use for fairly efficient B-roll. And in many cases, some of the videos I make do that. I use a lot of footage from a fairly, you know, niche YouTuber named Chugga Conroy. You might have heard of him. Beyond that, I do capture my own footage. So depending on the application, I capture my footage in a number of different ways. The primary software I use to capture gameplay footage is the Open Broadcast Software System. This is a free software that anyone can use. If you're playing a game on your PC, all you have to do is install this, start recording, and play your game. However, if you're capturing from, say, a console and you don't want to emulate, that's where things get a little tricky. So for stuff like my Switch and my PS5, I use this. This is an Elgato Game Capture HD60S. I bought this when I was in college, and it served me fairly well when it comes to capturing content. And again, you don't need this, but if you want to capture your own footage or get into something like streaming, this is actually a fairly nice thing to have, because even on platforms like PlayStation and Xbox, which have onboard capture and streaming capabilities, you still run into the occasional blocked cutscene, and this circumvents that. That being said though, I actually am retiring this thing because I hit the technical limits on this. I bought a new HDMI splitter to use as part of my recording setup because I was sick of unplugging stuff for my Switch and PS5 anytime I needed to use this. So I just split the signal, could have them always connect to the TV and then split them off into a apparatus that then connects to this thing. And this is incompatible with the splitter because it's too high res. This is the HD60S. I probably could have gone for a bigger upgrade since we're entering the 4K era, but they were like $300, $400, so like, this was 200. It was much better and much more within my budget, so yeah. Obviously, this only works for consoles that have an HDMI out. If it's an older console that has AV cables, well, I'm probably just gonna use the virtual console on like the Switch or the Wii U, if I'm honest. But the other way I can go about doing it is by using something else. And that's what I use for the various videos I've made on 3DS games. So that would be Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon, Pokemon Omega Ruby, and Pokemon X were all captured in this manner. And don't tell Nintendo this, I modded my 3DS. I have custom firmware on it that allows me to basically broadcast video signal over Wi-Fi to my PC, and then I just capture that in OBS. It's a pain and has some really ugly looking artifacting if you really squint at it, and can drop frames quite often, but 3DS capture boards are expensive, and a lot of those companies either went under or want you to send your 3DS in, and that's 
not a risk I'm willing to take for a console that's no longer in circulation. Also, you can't use uh, DS games because the 3DS boots into native DS hardware, and so custom firmware just doesn't work on that. Same deal for any of the GBA virtual consoles if you were a uh, legacy 3DS owner. In terms of cameras, I currently use a Canon EOS 90D, which is a pretty expensive piece of hardware. However, you can't just set a camera down and record willy-nilly. You need to also have your scene be well lit. And so that's where you get into the equipment that I use for lighting. So what I've got for lighting is I've got a softbox that I bought off of Amazon. I actually bought two, but I'm only using one for this video right now. And I've got it positioned basically directly behind the camera and above, shining down on my face, and that basically illuminates my entire body. And then I also have these LED RGB panels that can go through a pretty wide range of different colors. And I usually use that as some sort of accent light on my face, just to sort of, you know, give the video a bit of a more interesting look. Also, when I started, I was a huge fan of ContraPoints, and that styling is still sort of there in some regards. In terms of how I actually record the videos, I record them in manual mode with the settings of 4K resolution, 30 frames per second, with the widest possible aperture settings, and a shutter speed of 1 over 60, with 400 ISO. That is not a set in stone setting, that's just what I'm currently using to record this video. Actually, part of the reason that I moved away from more scripted videos was to get rid of the teleprompter because I would have to zoom in and that would force me to use a less wide aperture, which then makes the scene darker and makes it more prone to noise. And some of you might be asking, why do you film in 4K if you export in 1080p? And that's called because I zoom in. If you film in 4K and you look at your footage later and there's something in the frame that you don't like, or you might want to zoom in on an element of the frame to sort of, you know, bring emphasis to something or some other reasons that we'll talk about later, you can do that by having a wider resolution and you can cut those things out without losing quality. The other aspect that I use for recording is the audio. So I've used two main microphones throughout this channel's lifespan. I use this AT2020 that I'm using right now, which is a fairly good condenser microphone. It's an XLR version because I didn't know what I was buying at the time. Otherwise, I probably would have bought the USB version, but either way, it works fairly well for what I'm doing, but you have to be fairly close to it. So it doesn't really work as, you know, if you don't want the microphone on screen. For those videos that didn't have the microphone on screen, I used a Rode VideoMic Pro, which was a fairly good microphone, but I sort of like the sound of the condenser mic better than that thing. And also this room that I'm recording in right now is very, very echoey. And this helps mitigate it by having the mic closer to me, I've noticed. Also, another aspect of the video that I've used in the past is green screen. So I've got this collapsible green screen that I bought off of Amazon that again is pretty neat, but from there, we move on to the editing process. So editing a video, I use Premiere Pro and the rest of the Adobe Suite for other parts of the process. Again, that's my personal choice. You don't need to use it. There are free alternatives out there that you can utilize. You don't need to spend money. So when I go to actually create the main timeline that I use for editing, I sort of use a system of layers. So if you're using your phone, you might not have an issue with this, but if you're using a fancier camera, because of regulations in the European Union, I'm pretty sure, DSLRs cap at 30 minutes of recording. So for longer videos, I often have more than 30 minutes of footage, obviously. So I constantly have to stop and restart recording in order to make that happen. And to maintain a little bit of uniformity into things like the color grading and the audio, what I do is I have an initial timeline that has all of the raw MP4 files off the camera in them laid together, usually called raw footage. Then I nest that all into a second timeline which is usually the audio edited timeline. And in the cases where you're gonna record your audio and video separately, you have to do a little something called syncing it. Thankfully, Premiere has a fairly easy feature that allows you to do that. All you have to do is basically line your timelines up, have your original in-camera capture with the onboard mic's audio and your independent audio on a separate layer, highlight them both, and then the software will learn where exactly your footage needs to go and sync them up. Once this is done, you can 
cut off the beginning and the end because normally I start my audio recording before the video and then pull up the audio to erase the in-camera capture and then link those two clips. And from there, I can then use the audio from my microphone that I intend to use for the video. And then I take that last one and create the final timeline. This is where I set the actual settings that the video is going to be exported to, which is 1080p at 59.94 frames per second. And you might ask, why not 60? And the answer is cameras. There's a weird oddity of cameras where a 30 frames per second capture is actually 29.97. So it, again, it's a minor thing and it basically just like drops a frame every five seconds. So not a big deal. And the reason I use a 60 frames per second footage, even though I'm recording my face in 30, is because, well, I'm capturing 60 frames per second footage off of OBS. And a lot of games, not Pokemon usually, can support up to 60 frames per second. So I would like to at least have that capability when I switch to the gameplay footage. But either way, I take the original 4K footage and I usually scale it down to, in a lot of cases, 50%, but in some cases, if there's something in the frame that I don't like, 55, 60, as the baseline of where most of the footage is delivered. And then I'm able to zoom in as I need to for various aspects of the video. At this point though, I don't start editing immediately. Instead, what I do is I take my raw footage with none of the edits applied and export it as an audio file. I take that exported file and open it in Adobe Audition. And then using the remove silence tool, I identify any long extended pauses in the video. The presets I normally use is three quarters of a second. Any pause longer than that, I identify as a long pause. And I take those pauses and identify them as what's called a subclip. This allows me to then re-import this into Premiere as a series of clips of that length. Uh, but obviously I can't just take an audio file and drag it into the video and be able to get what I want out of it. So I take that audio file and export it using Adobe Media Encoder back into an MP4 video. What I make a very, very concerted effort to do is make sure that it's exported at the same frame rate as my main timeline. This is important for the next stage of the process. Once I've exported this empty video with a bunch of subclip markers, I import that into my project, deleting the original raw file, but leaving all of the subclips. And then I take those and create what's called a single cam multicam sequence. Basically all the subclips are taken and lined up to their various time codes into a timeline. I can then highlight all that, copy it, put my cursor at the start of my main timeline, paste that in, these clips go in and right over top of the main footage, and then I hit delete and all my long pauses are removed. This allows me to cut down the amount of footage I wade through and have a lot of various points where the footage is already cut, which helps facilitate a lot of pauses that I would have already removed. I then take that footage, pull the first clip of the entire sequence to the beginning, and then use the feature called close gap. And it will take all of these segmented cutout little clips and condense them together. You now have this fully condensed timeline of only clips of your voice, which is the part you care about. From here, I go through what's called my first pass of the edit. So obviously I'm not perfect and I make mistakes. So what I do is I basically, I play through the clip on two times speed and identify any mistakes or retakes or any other cases where there's footage that I don't want to include in the final product and I remove them. Once that process is done, I now have a rough draft of what I want to say. And now the real edit begins. This is where I begin the actual process of applying all of the additional edits I want to this video. The first major edit that I'm normally gonna do is in regards to the color grading. That is basically taking the in-camera footage and making some color edits in order to make it look better. Normally what I use is Adobe's Lumetri color feature, which has an auto button, you can hit that and it will figure out the best preset, which normally get the footage fairly close. But then again, I do usually go in and play with it. For example, on my Halloween video, I used it to basically real drastically cool the color temperature and give it like a very dark, more blue look to it, which I think turned out really well. But it's something where you can just sort of play around with. There's tons of tutorials on YouTube about how to do color grading and whatnot. It's not a huge deal. I would still try to focus on having something good in camera and only making tiny edits. And the reason I do all this color grading first is because I'm going to then take all that footage and render it in Premiere. What rendering does is it takes all of the clips you place in the timeline and turns them into individual video files. 
This then creates previews, which makes scrubbing through the timeline a lot easier. And normally I do this before I do that first pass of the edit, but you can do it at any point in the timeline. The reason I use it is for something I'll explain when I talk about exporting. And this sometimes takes some time, so usually I'll get up and, you know, get a snack or watch something on YouTube on my TV and just sort of let it sit. This is especially true if I'm using a green screen, because green screen effects take a long time. And also, if your footage is really noisy and you want to try to get rid of the noise of the After Effects, don't. It takes hours. Only use it if you have like maybe a couple minutes of like nighttime shots that you just need to clean up. But once this is done, I go through and start the actual editing process. And this is arguably the most fun, which is where you're making various changes. So things I might do is as I'm saying something and talking about a various topic, I might flash an image of say the cover of a game on screen. I will also frequently do things like overlay footage. And this is where the part about filming in 4K really comes into play here. So jump cuts are part of YouTube, like that's undeniable. But if you want to try to hide them and give your video a more professional look, what you can do is you can zoom your frame in on a cut and the reframe sort of hides the fact that there was a cut there from all but the most astute of viewers. But the reverse is that if you have footage where you like talk for a couple seconds, zooms in, zooms out again, and just does that repeatedly, that can get a little boring and repetitive and a little bit annoying. So something you might also want to do if you have a lot of little clips that are all cut up together is you want to overlay some footage. This is what's called B-roll. This is where your gameplay footage comes in. You can also use it if you want to illustrate a point about what you're talking about, is you can flash the footage of exactly what you're talking about on screen, and that helps keep the audience engaged because they're giving new things to look at, and provides a visual aid for what you're talking about. While I assume you all have lovely, beautiful voices, we are all bored and our attention spans have been wrecked by apps like TikTok and Twitter, so... You gotta do something to keep your audience engaged, and flashing pretty colors on screen helps a lot. This is part of what makes editing take a long time for me, because in a lot of cases, I might be hunting for that footage through my hours and hours of gameplay. So it's best, in my opinion, to make sure that your gameplay footage is cut up. I try to keep my footage in mostly half hour to one hour segments, and that makes it the easiest for me to page through and find what I'm looking for. Also, when you're using footage from other YouTubers, they usually have uh, titles in the title card and you can sort of use that as a guide to look for the footage that you want. But once you have all of your edits and all of your clips in place, other thing that I usually add to my videos is my citations. So I came up with a citation format that basically is a stripped down version of some of the ones I learned in high school and college. Once all the videos edited, Usually at some point in the process, I will also edit the audio. So I used to do this directly in Premiere with various settings. However, that would lead to an issue that's actually a fairly common one with Premiere that Adobe refuses to fix. You people charge $52 a month for this and you refuse to fix this like kind of major issue. But either way, I record the audio separately. I'm just gonna use Adobe Audition. And my presets normally include some combination of a noise reduction and audio gate to sort of cut out any background noise that might end up in the recording just to sort of give it that more clean sound to it. Other edits that I tend to perform usually is some sort of equalizer just to sort of give my voice a little bit more presence on a recording. And then what's called a compressor. What the compressor does is it will take any audio above a certain threshold and lower it by a certain amount, reducing the dynamic range. And then I take that and normalize it to a volume that is suitable for the format that I'm using. From there, I might put a limiter on things just to make sure anything that's super loud is also just cut down after the compressor. But with that, I've got an audio that is pretty even and you can hear the quietest parts of my voice while also having, you know, at least some dynamic range. Once that's all put together and the audio for the voice is edited, this is usually where I put the music on. I put the music on last. And normally I get most of my music from just like the various games I'm talking about. Not technically legal. You can get burned for this, but usually it's a case where the studios just don't care if you're using like their music as background music. Like. I've noticed like any like, you know, music by a record label or from a movie don't like you will get copyrighted for it. But for video game music, you'll normally get away with it. But once all the music's put on and you know, where I think it's appropriate, changing music every so often and sort of fits the theme of the video that I want. I then have all my footage put together. I do one last watch through where I usually catch some mistakes and correct them. And I've made sure like things like the music isn't too loud. My voice is audible and there aren't, you know, again, any issues with the editing that need to be addressed. I go through, 
usually while I'm working through the process, because normally videos will take a couple days to finish, I will go through, render all the footage as I'm going, and then I go to export. The videos are being uploaded to YouTube as MP4s, but I'm originally going to export it as an Apple QuickTime video. And the reason for that is pretty simple. So I made a huge stress about how I'm rendering the footage as I go through. This is because I use a process known as smart rendering. So what I'm going to do is all these little previews that I've rendered to use in Premiere so it doesn't lag out are then going to be taken and turned into the final product. So I'm basically exporting in the same preset that I made my previews at. This is a setting that you actually have to change in Premiere. But this provides a few things. One, if I catch a mistake after I've exported, it's fairly easy to export again few seconds of footage that were off. I could easily take that .mov file and upload that directly to YouTube, but that is not a good idea. The file size is pretty big compared to a compressed format like MP4. So what I'm gonna do is take that outputted file, put it into Adobe Media Encoder, and then transcode it, which is basically changing the codec for the video, into an mp4. And then I take that smaller file, and that moves on to the next process. So this is the easy part, theoretically. This is where you take your finished video, you go into YouTube Studio, you hit upload, you drag it in, and then from there, you wait. Well, actually what you should be doing is you should be inputting your title and description and doing your thumbnail. So for the title, I usually come up with something that I think is gonna work. I type it in, and that's about the extent of it. I don't do a whole lot of like super like extensive like, uh, search engine optimization, honestly. Like, don't take SEO advice from me. If you wanna go viral, like, this is the wrong channel for that. I also have a template for the description that has the basic rough outline of what I want. You know, the small text description that'll show up at the start of the description that usually has keywords that make it a little bit more searchable, all my social media links, the source list for the video when relevant, where any additional footage came from, and also the timestamps, which is what creates the YouTube chapter system. That's because that's what annotates the hashtags above the video title, if you didn't know. This is also where I select the tags, which I normally use a site called Rapid Tags. Just put the title in, pick the tags that I think for are relevant. And then I also usually go in and add a few more tags to things that I think are relevant. Like I'm talking about, say, um, the Johto region. Like I'm talking about Pokemon Gold and Silver. I might put like Johto, Pokemon Gold, Pokemon Silver, just like various combinations of the same thing that people might search for. And that is supposedly helps. I'm not exactly sure how the algorithm gods work. So uh, yeah, but from there, I also have to create a thumbnail. I usually do this in Adobe Photoshop. So the composition of my thumbnails is fairly basic. I will usually have my face because having a human face in the footage, supposedly again, psychologically makes people more likely to click and you know, gives a very instant recognition as to who made the content. And then I also will usually have some sort of tagline, some you know, small amount of text, normally not more than like a couple words, like three to four is usually what I try to shoot for. And then I have some sort of element from the game and a background. And that's basically my thumbnails. I make these in Photoshop, export them as a PNG at 1280 by 720. I don't know why I had to think about that for a second. Like it's a fairly standard resolution upload that, and then once that's done, I will do the end card, which uh, matches up with a template that has a link to my channel and you know a video that is suggested by YouTube, in case you were wondering, one of these videos is what the algorithm thinks you'll watch for my channel, and then two more that I usually pick that I think are relevant. And then I also usually will do cards throughout the video. Usually I just like, you know, try to space them out evenly as you're watching, but if there's like a very specific point where I make reference to one of my other videos, I'll usually try to put that in there. At that point, I will usually schedule my videos. What I usually schedule for is 10 a.m. EST on any given day. And with that, that's basically how I make my videos. Uh, this felt a little rambly at points and I probably will cut this down a lot in the edit, but like, yeah. I thought I'd share with you guys exactly what I do and uh, I really don't know how to end this video. <laughs> Yeah, there's these, neither this nor the Crisis Core video had an extensive script, so, uh, yeah, I don't care. Alright, uh, see you guys.